All right, good morning. So, today, I have kind of a special class for you. Um, I am planning to have a bit of a quiz on it at some point. Um, so for those of you who may watch it later or for your peers, probably encourage them to watch it later. I think this is a, this is a particular case where it's not really, I'm not really gonna test it on you, test you on it, um, but I think it's certainly worth um, thinking about, talking about, having as sort of a particip more of a participation sort of a, a deal. So um, how many of you have heard of or know much about the Flint water crisis? A little bit, you know, um, so I guess now it's been seven years of time's flying because I was actually living in Michigan when all that started, or I guess I moved there kind of just after it started. Um, but kind of today I'm going to walk you through a timeline of the Flint water crisis, crisis um, which is really a two or three crises combined in, in some sense. Um, and so, yeah, time flies. It's a little bit recent history now rather than current event, sort of. But if you go on Wikipedia every year, it's like there's some new developments of who's in trouble and most recently who wiped their phones before getting in trouble. And so it's it's kind of a crazy timeline, um, all things considered. So I want to go over specifically the um, kind of the, the failures in the water treatment system and some of the public health um, approach to identifying what's wrong, how that works, um, in part because my wife works or has uh, recently worked in public health. And the reason we were in Michigan in the first place was right after we had graduated from grad school, she had a fellowship up there um, to work as a work at the state in an epidemiology sort of position. So she was really in public health and dealt with the Legionnaire's disease outbreak that was going on concurrently um, and associated with the uh, Flint water crisis. And so I actually have some personal experience with the whole matter and thought that that might be kind of interesting because I, I ended up working in uh, Michigan's DEQ, which fortunately, yeah, at the time I was like, oh man, I, I kind of wish I had been hired into the uh, drinking water division uh, section because, you know, that was sort of my, more of my expertise coming out of grad school, but I was in the wastewater permitting section and looking back, I'm actually very thankful because that saved me any sort of drama from uh, <laughs> the Flint water crisis. Um, Cause yeah, that we'll, we'll get into the details, but okay. So what happened really, um, the main headline you probably have heard about, um, even if you're not kind of recalling it at the moment, would be the lead in the drinking water. So there's lots of um, lead, so heavy metal found in drinking water. And the reason that was found was there was a pediatrician, so a children's doctor, who noticed elevated blood lead levels in kids. And so when it was discovered to be a problem, it was already a major problem causing permanent harm to children. Um, so that obviously is a terrible thing. Um, and, you know, it, it was, it was really awful that it took that long to discover there was that issue. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that. There's a couple of papers I have kind of the abstract art from one of them highlighted here. Um, I believe I've got these posted on Moodle. I'll double check that they're visible to you, but essentially I have also the uh, papers right here. So I'll just open these. So we've got a couple different papers. Um, there was a professor, the, I think it's Virginia Tech. Yeah. Um, Mark Edwards, who really spearheaded a bit. Some, some people felt like it wasn't his business to be coming from Virginia over here or over there to Michigan and getting involved. In fact, my wife even had some uh, impressions from the state that like, what is this guy doing here? He's just causing drama. 
but it, it turns out he was actually he actually did do some good work was kind of pushing against some of the um, the political forces that that existed and has some very harsh words for both the EPA and um, some of the other agencies uh, for their actions or inactions so if you go to YouTube and look for him lecturing on the topic that's a, a whole nother story um, it's fascinating and I think I've got a link in the slides today to that um, so if you wanted a, a second perspective that was even a little more hands-on that would be a good one so um, there's a couple papers here I think there are more but these ones are highlighting the uh, corrosion control and kind of the Legionnaire's disease stuff. So I wanted to show you that, a couple resources, and they will be on Moodle, if they're not already. Okay, so where did this happen? Well, in Michigan, and I guess you can kind of get the feel for the hand. If you ever ask somebody in Michigan where they're from, they'll, they'll show you the hand. They'll, they'll take their, uh, I guess their right hand and, and do this. They'll be like, oh, I, li I live over here, or I live over here. Um, and so I just uh, using this little uh, mitt here. So technically, Michigan also contains the upper peninsula up here. So they've got a little hat sort of thing. Um, so the Flint water crisis really was in Flint, Michigan, which is what we have highlighted here. As a reference, you may have heard of Detroit, probably probably heard of it. So Detroit's there, Grand Rapids is nearby. Lansing is the state capital, that's where I lived. Um, and East Lansing is where Michigan State uh, University is. University of Michigan's over off in, I'm sorry, I said Grand Rapids, I meant Ann Arbor. Um, probably the funny look. Um, Grand Rapids is in the west area. And then you've got Traverse City up here and Mackinac Island stuff and the Upper Peninsula. So, that's sort of a, a brief rundown. So Lansing itself is not too far from Flint, uh, about an hour, hour and 20 minutes, something like that. And Flint is kind of neighbors to uh, Detroit. And so that connection there is gonna be, gonna be pretty important. All right, so we had lead in the water. Let's come back to what else happened. Well, there was also this Legionnaire's outbreak and Legionnaire's disease is essentially a bad case of pneumonia. Um, it is, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more in depth about it, but there was an outbreak and it was partly associated with hospitals and hospital water and water systems. And then they had, the Flint water treatment plant itself had too high coliforms on a couple of occasions and therefore they overchlorinated, so they had too high disinfection byproducts related to that. And so they were a mess. Um, in terms of their um, their stuff. So we'll talk through this timeline here. And essentially what Flint did was they, they decided they wanted their own water supply and they had some plans for that. Um, and they didn't implement that particularly wisely. And the decision making is really a, going to be a common theme of problems here. Okay, so let's start back in about 1900. Um, back then, we didn't know lead was so bad. Um, so we made a lot of pipes out of lead, and these are pipes used to convey water. Uh, sounds a lot like the Roman aqueducts. Um, in fact, the word for lead is pretty much the same Latin root as plumber. So PB, if you look in the periodic table, that's lead, right? That, that's our symbol for lead. Well. If you look at the word plumber, it kind of has the same constituting P and B there. It's from the same Latin root because plumbing was often done with lead because it's easy to, to work with and that, or that type of thing. Easy to make seals, easy to manipulate, create pipes, all that. So lead pipes were installed and they're sitting in the ground. 100 years later, plus um, sort of becoming a problem, but as, as you know from um, previous lecture, corrosion control can kind of solve that problem in some sense, so long as we're not leaching the lead out. That, that is ultimately the big problem here. Okay, so the next important 
step of the timeline is the auto industry boom. That's kind of the 1930s through 60s. Flint actually is doing really well during that time, and Michigan in general, what we now consider the Rust Belt was booming with industry. Maybe, well, maybe call it the Steel Belt back then, I don't know. Um, so a lot of steel industry, a lot of auto industry, lots of jobs, lots of, um, lots of wealth being generated, people are moving to the area, um, good things for the, the people there. Following that, we have economic disaster as the auto industry sort of collapses. Now, I don't know enough about history and economy and all that, um, but I suppose the, uh, the jobs moved elsewhere, maybe these went overseas, maybe that was later, but during this time, that industry sort of collapsed. It was not, not such a hot industry. I think we were getting steel from other places and certainly um, not producing as many cars there. Some of the auto manufacturing plants, uh, I guess, may have moved or closed. Um, so that led to the region to have severe economic depression. Um, and so when that happens, people are going to move away if they can. And if they can't, they're going to just be there. And there's going to be a lot of vacant homes. It's going to be um, generally, you know, if one industry leaves and this town was sort of built on that one industry, then there's going to be a lot of jobs, secondary jobs that came in, you know, somebody to work the, the coffee shop, someone to work the grocery stores. Well, now you don't need so many coffee shops and grocery stores. How do you keep them in business? How do you keep them running? If there's secondary layoffs or job loss in that regard. So that, that whole um, phenomenon or process really devastated the area and then you've got lots of poverty and poverty goes typically hand in hand with crime unfortunately which is kind of a, a neg you know a uh, reinforcing feedback loop there so Flint in general and a lot of areas like it in the region really having a hard time since since then um, so uh, all the way up to about 2000 then. Um, historically, Michigan had decided to do revenue sharing where cities would be collecting their, their taxes and then re the state government would redistribute that and help these cities that are um, in a really hard spot. So Flint was historically getting money then from, let's say, Grand Rapids was doing well, Ann Arbor was doing well. Um, Essentially, they would take money from the, the Ann Arbor and Grand Rapids residents were paying and spread that over to Flint and to other places. Um, well, in the early 2000s, the state government decided to stop doing that. And I think that might have been a gradual process over a few years. Um, I don't remember the specifics, but that really um, put extra hardship on, on Flint in particular. And, you know, you could... You could certainly debate the morality of that, the practice itself or the stopping of it. So I'm, I'm not here to really comment on um, the right way of things, but you could, it would be reasonable to say, why would you stop doing that? These people are in need, this area is in need. You can also say on the flip side, why would you do that? You're taking people's money away from them that they're paying to have, to their municipality so that their municipality can serve them. That's their local government. Um, why would you do that? So there's there's certainly some moral arguments. It's a, gonna be a struggle one way or another. And it's, you know, something I think we can legitimately have sympathy for, for Flint um, and for the state in general for the context itself. No one likes suffering, no one likes poverty, no one likes that economic hardship and all the malaise that goes with it. Okay, so this is kind of the setup for bad decision making, because at this point, by 2010-ish, um, Flint is really not doing well, it's going bankrupt, it's um, defaulting on its uh, financial obligations, and really something, something needs to change, and it's, you know, I'm not going to say and I have no idea who exactly 
has made the wrong decisions or who is at fault to that point. Um, but moving forward, one thing I can say is their approach to manage it resulted in quite a few failures. And that all begins in 2011 when the state starts appointing what are called emergency managers. I'll abbreviate, uh, I'll abbreviate that as EMs. These emergency managers are essentially state appointed people that are put into Flint. And I think there maybe there's a couple other cities as well with the express intent to manage their finances in such a way that they would no longer be faulting on their um, their debts uh, and their obli financial obligations. So in some sense, that makes sense. OK, if you can't make proper decisions, we're going to have to do that for you because you owe us money sort of thing. You know, it, on the one hand, maybe that sounds like it makes sense, at least on paper. On the other hand, these people are not from Flint. They have no um, input from Flint or they don't, they don't require input from Flint to make decisions or their residents, as we'll see. And they don't necessarily know what they're doing. Um, maybe they're financially savvy, that may be a benefit, but can they manage a city and manage municipalities? Well, certainly they were not very capable in some way. So uh, the other thing is they're, they're just their year by year appointments. So there's hardly any longevity, hardly any accountability there either. Okay, so in 2013, here's where our trouble really begins. Um, and by the way, at this point, I'm in grad school. Um, I've been in grad school since 2009. And in 2014, um, I, grad, I finished grad school and moved to Michigan. So we'll talk about that. I'll mention that in a moment. But in 2013, the emergency manager decides to switch water sources from Detroit Water and Sewerage Department. Um, I think it might have been DTW back then, renamed it or something. Um, but essentially, the Detroit system had been um, providing water to Flint for many years because Detroit has a large treatment plant. They're taking, taking water. Um, I'm going to pull up a, the map so we can just take a look at that. the different water sources. Sorry. We should just get rid of this. All right, anyway, so we've got Flint here. We've got Detroit uh, just southeast, Lansing to the southwest. Now, Detroit's getting their water, I think, from uh, essentially from Lake Huron through St. Clair River um, here. I could be wrong about that. Maybe they get it from Lake St. Clair, but I think they draw it from a little further up. Anyway, uh, Flint decided that they wanted to, and I, I guess this, this had been a plan that had been tossed around a little bit for some time, but they wanted to draw their water straight from Lake Huron. And so in conjunction with Saginaw, I think there was, there was gonna be some sort of a pipe infrastructure uh, built to draw water from Lake Huron, and that was gonna be a good water source, and they would no longer have to rely on uh, Detroit. Flint had a small water treatment plant there to kind of re-up the treatment and um, take whatever Detroit was delivering and making sure it was up to up to par, add a little bit more chlorine dosing. And so they had some infrastructure and they're like, well, we can use this um, and and make, you know, and do all that. And we could be independent from all this money that we're paying Detroit. Um, because they, they believed they could save some money. And I think the, uh, the goal there was to save about $5 million um, over a few years. So let's 
say So that was their motivation. So over the course of four or five years, they could save five million dollars. If they had if they do the switch, you know, it would take a little bit of time for the, to recoup the cost, but eventually they'd be paying less and it would be presumably a financially savvy decision. However, um, the Detroit water system kind of got angry at the sudden plans to change, that Flint was gonna just up and change on them. And um, I guess Detroit's water treatment system, uh, water and sewage department, heard of this secondhand or something without being talked to. I don't know, I just heard that they were angry about it and essentially gave Flint a one-year termination notice. So they're like, well, if you're gonna just cancel on us at any time without talking to us first, then we're just gonna go ahead and plan for you to be off of this in a year. And so they essentially give Flint a timeline that I guess Flint was not prepared for or planning for. Oh, so it's a one-year termination notice um, and Flint's like, all right, we'll figure it out. Um, to my knowledge, they didn't really uh, battle Detroit to ask for more time. I, I don't know what went down there. Maybe Detroit's water and sewage department was at fault there. If so, I think they later redeemed themselves as you might see. Um, okay, so then in that moment, Flint's realizing their plans need to be, um, they're not fast enough. So they're gonna have to make an alternate plan and so they decide, okay, well, we're gonna use the Flint River water is ultimately their, um, their decision. And so, and this says, by the way, more corrosive, I'm sorry to put those online. I'll just move this aside for a moment. Oh, I forgot. I'm supposed to move my webcam. Okay, so. So Flint decides to switch to the Flint River, um, which by the way, kind of has a notorious reputation for being um, gross, <laughs> being polluted by the auto industry. Like there's some nasty sediments in there full of heavy metals and toxic wastes that could get kicked up. Now, that's not, necessarily a problem because they can of course draw water from kind of above the area where there are contaminations and monitor that situation make sure that's not too bad but the Flint River has a reputation um, the, the local people know that this Flint River, River that's running through here is not the uh, not the most pristine river you've ever seen um, so that's gonna put it in the people's minds already that this water is gonna be bad when they hear that, oh, now we're drinking from the Flint River, gross. Um, the real problem is that the Flint water, the Flint River is naturally more corrosive, got less alkalinity, um, possibly uh, higher or lower pH than the, um, the water they were receiving from Detroit. And here's where the Flint water crisis, I would say, really begins. Um, I'm still in grad school at that point. Um, so I'm in Atlanta. And with the water being more corrosive, this is really the first failure that we see. I mean, so far there's been some decision-making that was questionable, but as they decide to do this, um, there were some, some decisions along that process that required engineering audits of, okay, what what do we need treatment-wise? What do we have treatment-wise? Do we have enough capacity? All of that. And that's where the, the first failures really come into play. Um, first of all, they needed corrosion control and they didn't have it. So as, in some sense, that doesn't sound like a huge deal, but the Flint water crisis really highlights how big a deal that is because then with the more corrosive water coming through, the pipes are starting, 
instead of accumulating some mineral deposits, now you're eroding away the mineral deposits. You get nasty looking water if you uh, turn back to, I'm not gonna do that. Um, if you turn back to our uh, paper here, you can see the, the color there, of the water, or the color of these water samples. Essentially, you're eroding or corroding all the junk off the pipes, and that's just getting into the water. And that becomes a big problem as you start leaching lead particulates off, and that's getting in water and people are consuming it. Okay, so immediately, April 2014, residents start complaining about the water quality. Um, they notice the change immediately. Now we talked a little bit about aesthetic standards. And so one thing that is happening here is the, the water facility is testing water and they are required to check lead at that point. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's continuous or how often, but there is a, a check required at the treatment plant. And in terms of the primary standards for water quality, they're being met. Um, there is no lead in the water coming out of the treatment plant. The, uh, the water quality parameters, according to regulation, they were fine. There were some aesthetic concerns, you know, it didn't taste as good, maybe it was slightly, had a slight color, but technically the water was fine to drink. And so the, uh, um, the government was essentially telling the people that, hey, it's fine, there's no problem, um, drink the water, don't be silly. Um, and, you know, you can imagine how that, how that goes, right? Um, well, in August, so probably the, the hottest point for Michigan, which is not saying a whole lot, it, it gets hot and humid, but not, not like Louisiana. Um, they have their first problem coming out of the water treatment plant. So with the higher temperature, um, there's a lot more bacteria in the water, so the, fecal, the coliform load is higher, and they get hit with um, a boil water advisory because they had too many coliforms in the water. So too many bacteria are surviving the treatment system and coming out. And so Flint issues a boil water advisory to the residents that those usually last a few days. Um, sometimes they'll have them if you have a water main break or something like that. Um, however, if you have something where the treatment system itself is not actually up to snuff to treat this, that's that's a pretty uh, damning issue there. So it turns out, by the way, that their treatment capacity really was not quite sufficient. Um, they, I guess, estimated or did some calculations and it was almost sufficient, but not truly sufficient. And so that's one of their issues here is to, to manage the high load of um, stuff here they uh, had to overchlorinate. With the overchlorination, then they're getting high trihalomethanes or one of the uh, disinfection byproducts. Um, analytes, we measure for that, see if see about the uh, disinfection byproducts. And so in August of 2014, this is when I'm uh, technically graduating, um, getting my degree, uh, that's, that's happening, all of that's going on. And at the same time, the city officials are saying, hey, the water is safe. Presumably after the boil water advisory, I guess maybe a week later or whatever, saying the water is safe. But the city is ordering truckloads of bottled water to supply their office workers. Because the office workers are refusing to drink the water. And so it's a, kind of an insane uh, amount of hypocrisy here, right? It, it's pretty incredible that they're they're doing that. All right. So by December 2014, and, and I uh, I ended up getting married and moving to Michigan in October.
just to kind of make you aware of where I'm coming into the picture. And of course, I'm not really aware of this. Nobody except, you know, the emergency manager, the, the local people at this point are aware because it really hasn't been made a big um, news item to this point. Okay, so by December 2014, Flint had already spent $4 million on water treatment plant upgrades. That's just their water treatment plant. That's not including the, uh, the other pieces of the, the puzzle to connect to Lake Huron. This is just for the Flint River stuff. And really, it's, it's questionable whether or not this is even sufficient. Okay, so Flint spends $4 million on water treatment upgrades, still does not have corrosion control. And so they're still sending bad water through the system bad, what I mean by bad is that it's causing lead to leach off the pipes. And the thing about the pipes, by the way, is that since they were installed so long ago, we don't really have records, blueprints of where, where these pipes are. So you could go to an old home and you just kind of have to dig around. If you're gonna, if you're gonna get the premise plumbing, um, maybe inside the house, but even that, you just, you'll have to tear down walls with a guess. It's like, okay, I think it's gonna go here and you know, have some deconstruction involved there. And then in the front yard or in the side, wherever the pipes are going, there's another big question of, okay, where, where are these pipes? So that's a, a big problem for replacement. Okay, anyhow, they're already kind, you know, the emergency manager has already cost the city pretty much more than um, they were planning to save, or almost more, on this side project that probably could have been avoided had they maybe made arrangements with Detroit, had better negotiations with Detroit, something like that. Um, and that's all not to mention the harm that they've done by allowing lead to leach from the pipes. Okay, so January 2015, Detroit's recognizing that Flint's in a hard spot and maybe they were not uh, not doing them kindly by um, disconnecting them with a one-year notice. Um, so they recognize Flint's in trouble and apparently they are keen to help. So they offer to reconnect and to waive the reconnection fee. And that's a pretty big deal because the reconnection fee is probably hundreds of thousands of dollars. So that's not insignificant. This is going to be all the engineering, um, design, all the construction equipment rented, all the excavating. It's actually a big project to dig up water mains, um, connect them or disconnect them, uh, pause service as needed, start service and adapt their treatment and their pumps to the new load or you know away from the load so this is actually a, a big expense okay so this is um i'm just going to say this would be costly so they are in my mind they're they're making amends for you know if they have wrong flint if you decide that that was a something that they did that was wrong, this seems to me like a a decent way. Um, they're reasonably quick about it. You know, the, this uh, the Flint water is really becoming known to be a problem. Um, and they were stepping up to say, "Hey, we'll reconnect for you. Um, why not get back on our system? We'll waive the fee. It's as if you never disconnect, right?" Well. The emergency manager rejects that offer because obviously he wants to poison the Flint residents. No, I'm kidding. Um, effectively, that's what happens in the decision, but obviously no one in their right mind would be uh, thinking that they're making a good decision for doing so. Um, in March, the city council votes unanimously to reconnect because Detroit's offer is sitting there and 
here we see the real trouble with the emergency manager situation. Um, he just vetoes the city council's vote. Um, so the city wants to have good water and the emergency manager is not allowing it. Um, there's probably something to do with the propagation of error here. I don't know if this is the, I think this is the same emergency manager. I don't know what date their appointment starts, their yearly appointments. Some of them were cycled through. They would be there a year, they're gone a couple of years and come back. Some of them would be there a couple of years and then gone. Uh, some just there for a year. Um, certainly uh, lots of blame to be to be thrown around if you uh, wanted a target. There's plenty of emergency managers to, uh, to point at, um, which is probably a big problem in itself. In the mid 2000, middle of the year 2015, um, really when the water crisis was it became known, I guess, nationally or publicly as a crisis. This is when, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a pediatrician um, had noticed elevated blood levels in children in Flint and was obviously really concerned and looking for ways to test the water. She came across Mark Edwards, professor at Virginia Tech. His work, he had done some work on water distribution systems and lead in um, Washington, DC. Um, also, I think unpopular work. Seems like he's he's been involved with politically unpopular but important um, research. That's kind of the, that public interface. So kind of an interesting spot. Um, Definitely some, um, I guess, uh, unpopular opinions from him in some ways, or unpopular to some people. So anyway, uh, the pediatrician ends up contacting him. He mobilizes his entire research group, kind of takes them off their research projects and says, hey, we're gonna go to Flint. We're gonna do as many measurements as we can. We're going to um, teach people how to collect water samples that are, um, you know, how to flush your water before you're taking the sample, do all the, you know, the research type protocols to get good data from the water samples. And so um, that, that connection um, really reveals the lead in the water that's coming out of the pipes. Um, so that's really when, kind of middle of 2015, that's when people realize what's going on. And, I'll be honest, I don't, I don't know myself that I heard too much about any of this uh, until that, that time frame. And even then, I wasn't aware directly that of the problem in its entirety. Right? It took some time for this, um, for the information to get out there and for people to understand um, really what was going on. So October 2015, Flint switches back to Detroit Water and Sewerage Department, just like the city council had wanted months ago, just like Detroit had offered almost a year before, and just like probably they should have stayed on the whole time. That brings corrosion control back into play because um, essentially Detroit was sending them water that had corrosion control in place. Um, had already been, was already being added. And by the way, con corrosion control is simply orthophosphate, typically. So orthophosphate is essentially another term for just plain phosphate, <laughs> BO4, three minus. Um, now this is probably coming in a, you know, sort of like phosphoric acid buffer. Um, if you look at the PKA for phosphoric acid, you get, um, you know, several different PKAs because it's triprotic acid, and you can have um, a pretty stable pH at around 7.1 with phosphoric acid. So you have a, it can work as a nice buffer to keep your pH in a nice spot. It also provides some benefit in terms of um, the uh, preventing um, metals from corroding in the first place. So it's not just that it's buffering the pH, although that's important, also um, anti-corrosive. So with that, um, essentially 
that solves the majority of the water crisis in terms of the conditions that lead to lead bringing, being brought out of the pipes. Now, it's not great to have lead pipes in the first place. So long as you're keeping good corrosion control, it shouldn't be a problem. So the, the answer does not have to be remove all the pipes, although I think people have gone that way just to, I guess, make a more of a point and more of an effort to show that, hey, we're serious about fixing this problem for good and all of that. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that money could have been better spent elsewhere. Um, who knows? But the, uh, the end of the day, that October 2015 is really when the bulk of the problem or the source of the problem is, is solved there. Um, January 2016, the governor finally admits to Legionnaires disease outbreaks that were actually ongoing through the summers of 2014 and 2015. This is what my wife was um, understanding was a problem and was understanding that there was a specific hospital that was probably um, a big part of that problem. But essentially, the theory is that um, the flip water with the different water conditions allowed more legionnaires or legionella bacteria to exist and perhaps to grow in these pipes. And then that essentially contaminated the McLaren Hospital's water supply or internal water works. And then they were exposing patients to Legionella, or Le um, yeah, Legionella. So there was a lot, several cases, or more cases than normal, an outbreak of Legionnaires' disease, um, many of which were related to hospital exposure. Okay, so I'll I'll have a few slides on that in particular in a minute. Um, and one of the things, by the way throughout the Legionnaires disease sort of thing. So my wife working as a, a fellow, sort of like an intern type of thing, a paid, paid position, um, but not officially working for the state, kind of working for the CDC, of just uh, on this fellowship program. She was talking with the Flint city officials who the, uh, the Flint's um, local health department, apparently their county used to have a great health department, but staff turnover or something, it, Turns out that recently, the, the people that worked in the um, Genesee County, was the county in, that Flint is in, their, um, their staff was very uh, uncooperative with the state government uh, for whatever reason. And I mean, I guess with all of this drama about state appointed emergency managers and all of that, I, I guess I can't blame them too much or disliking the state, but certainly it, it didn't help anything when they were refusing to take take the uh, instruction from the state to properly measure or take samples and have the correct lab procedures uh, performed on the samples to identify what DNA um, strands do we have, you know, what specific type of Legionella is infecting people, they never did the DNA testing they were supposed to. My wife, as an intern, just fresh out of grad school, even knew, you need to be doing this. Had contacted them, had been part of the team that was telling them, hey, you need to do this, and then they never did. Um, and so that was a big problem because that delayed the link that could be made from the Flint River, because you could take samples of Legionella in the, the pipes in the river, and in the patients and see if they matched. Except that the, the local health department was not doing that, uh, was not um, performing their part of that, that sequence. So anyway, um, eventually the CDC was able to establish a link between that outbreak and the Flint water. Um, I guess maybe they were able to find some, uh, some samples from somebody uh, that had not been destroyed or something or had, you know, had been preserved. I don't remember, I don't know exactly how they did that, but um, by this point, by the way, I started at LSU in 2016. So that ends my time in Michigan. And right now I 
actually just yesterday I reconnected with a couple friends from there and they said it snowed yesterday morning. <laughs> They're like, yeah, I'm kind of enjoying the sunny, sunny day today in the 70s. <laughs> yeah, and, and the fact that it snowed, you know, maybe that, that snow I'm sure will stick for a few days, um, might go away in Michigan, but pretty soon it's just not going to go away for months. And it's just going to be cold and dark and dreary and I'm, I'm just happy to be uh, to be here <laughs> okay so by 2021 um, I think I think in the spring is the last time I really updated this so at that point former governor Rick Snyder and eight city officials or government officials um, were charged with 34 felony two misdemeanor um, and two officials were charged with involuntary manslaughter. Now the manslaughter charges are related to the Legionella, Legionnaires disease outbreak because people did die from that. Now, Legionnaires disease is not too bad for most people, but if you're elderly, you're immunocompromised, you're already quite vulnerable, especially if you're already in a hospital with some sort of condition, it can be fatal. Um, just bad pneumonia can certainly be fatal. So the legal outfall continues. I was taking a look just this morning and I noticed that um, there was some probe further. And by the way, all of these things here, this was at the time charged with. That does not mean the charges had been, had stuck. You know, that just meant that um, trials were going to happen, right? That, I think that was a, Yeah, I don't know the, le the right legal terms, but they, they had been charged with, not convicted with at that point. So uh, I don't know if maybe that has gone through or not. Um, it's probably outdated information by now, I would guess. Um, but like I said, the legal outfall continues. There was some sort of probe that I guess maybe it was an independent uh, group or something was doing, found that several officials had wiped their phones before their phones had been investigated. So there's, the drama continues. Um, okay, so the kind of overview of the failures, first of all, corrosion control was the major one. Um, another one was inadequate treatment capacity. There was, uh, in, in light of that, there was excessive chlorination. And in light of that, there was the disinfection byproducts. Um, Adding too much chlorine is also not helping with the corrosion control system because chlorine is corrosive. So um, that doesn't help either. There's actually a couple other issues. One was the fact that historically there were many vacant homes, right? We talked about a little bit about the history of the area. Lots of vacant homes, some areas over 50% of homes in a neighborhood are vacant. That means it's gonna be a longer water age. So in terms of a distribution system, the longer the water sits in there, the longer it has for chlorine to decay, um, for corrosion to happen, for, um, for contamination to potentially seep in. Obviously, we, we, jet, we operate our water systems on a positive pressure basis so that water can only seep out, um, but it's just not a good thing. Um, if some bacteria was disinfected and then are able to repair themselves, this potentially um, gives them more time to do so. There's another issue here um, I haven't really touched on, and that is the way that the, uh, by regulation, municipalities check in the different taps in the community. Um, and there was some controversy here, and actually I need to go back through and look up the specific details. I'll give you my understanding of it that is, um, is too vague and not reliable at, to be taken as fact, okay? But my impression of it right now is that, and, and I do know that the rule, the, the lead water rule has been updated in our formal EPA guidelines in part because of this. Um, so as I understand it, normally you're supposed to collect from different taps in your community and it, it should not just be all of the same type you try to have like a restaurant tap or something there 
back of their facility, try to have some residential places. There's some set types of taps you're supposed to monitor and you have to turn it on, let it flush for X amount of time, take your sample, and then you analyze the data. And then there's also some statistical analysis that needs to happen to make sure there's no outliers or things are included or excluded based on what makes sense um, statistically. That led to some pretty nasty drama, I think, where somebody was accused of discarding high lead samples when they weren't supposed to, but it, which it, when in fact they were supposed to according to their methods. Something like that, I think, happened. Maybe there was malpractice, but I, I think that was actually legitimately what they were supposed to do. The system missed the fact that lead was coming out of so many people, so many people's uh, taps. And I think that ended up leading to the change in the ruling, the lead water rule, um, or so that that miss won't happen again and there's a little bit more clarity in terms of what samples are included. Um, in some sense, maybe they shouldn't have even sampled some places, but they did and we're just gonna discard the data because of the, the statistical um, methods or whatever. So I don't, I don't remember the specifics, but that was another thing that was happening and that should have, maybe could have, could have, maybe should have caught the, uh, the lead in the water sooner. Um, presumably the uh, updates to that will catch it quicker if something like this ever happens again. Okay, um, so that brings us to the legionellosis. So that's the name of the disease of the legionnaire's bacteria with my webcam back. So here's the bacteria. It is um, also known as Pontiac fever, first kind of found in Pontiac, Michigan. So it's endemic to a lot of places. Certainly Michigan is one of them. Um, gives you a pneumonia, I mentioned. Uh, it's pretty dangerous for old people. Fortunately, unlike COVID, it's not really transmitted from person to person, um, almost never. So you really have to be inhaling um, aerosols from a, a, like a shower or something that's really creating lots of aerosols with the bacteria in those. Um, sometimes outbreaks have been uh, associated with water cooling towers. So if you walk by the power plant, uh, thing at LSU with the cooling towers, um, all that spray. If something like that got contaminated with Legionella, then that could be a source of Legionellosis. Um, so yeah, that was the point. It's not transmitted person to person. Oops. By the way, these are my wife's slides. Um, I took and borrowed them, modified them just a little um, for for this. Thus, the change of uh, change of stuff. And I don't. Maybe I'm not supposed to show this thing, but we're borrowing here. I'm sure it's okay. <laughs> so, uh, just a quick little discussion on how diseases are supposed to be tracked, which might actually help uh, help you understand what goes on with COVID um, and all that. So, on the health side of things, you have some exposure leading to some illness. That person goes to a physician or a hospital, and from there, a diagnosis is suggested or made and said, hey, we think this is COVID. Hey, we think this is Legionella. So some, some uh, laboratory tests may be prescribed or maybe they have enough information. Maybe they can do the lab test right there. But as soon as you know for sure what's going on, then for a reportable disease, so certain diseases are what we call reportable, a common cold is not reportable. It'll be interesting to know when and if COVID ever becomes non-reportable, right? That'll, that'll be a real key to show, hey, this is just not really considered a thing anymore, right? AIDS would be reportable. Um, something, let's say, uh, norovirus, so that stomach bug, I, I believe is reportable, but um, the 
a, a flu, I do not, I do not think is reportable. I don't think we capture flu in a reported surveillance database. In fact, um, one thing I learned throughout the whole COVID thing was we actually just estimate flu deaths and stuff based on general respiratory illness incidents. So it's a, a, a statistical analysis, it's an algorithm we use to estimate the amount of flu. So if you ever hear anybody comparing things to the flu, it's kind of silly because we don't really have good data on that. <laughs> we, don't, we don't report the flu. <laughs> if you ever hear somebody trying to convince you to uh, take the flu shot because people die from it, we actually don't know how many people die from it. <laughs> it's very likely it it's, uh, can be fatal for, again, elderly, immunocompromised, so certainly some reason for that. My, my own doctor told me I don't need to really take the flu shot. My wife wants me to sometimes, so sometimes I do, but he was like, yeah, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> and since learning about the fact that it's not tracked, not even tracked, so the data that we do hear about the flu is kind of uh, silly in a way. I mean, maybe helpful. Anyway, that it's a little bit of a confusing topic and it doesn't, doesn't really matter too much. It's just kind of interesting. Okay, so anyway, for a reportable disease, the laboratory then, or the physician, needs to tell both the local health department and any larger surveillance databases. Um, sometimes this will happen directly, sometimes it'll have to go through the laboratory before that happens, and some, or sometimes from the health department. And usually the surveillance database, the health, local health department will be drawing data from that as well to see, okay, how many people are getting sick and where, so that they can maybe take some action investigate a, um, an outbreak and then also the uh, whatever state health department is going on, and in our case that would be LDH, they would be alerted to the thing as well. And so the epidemiologists, a lot of times um, you could call them, uh, I guess, an investigator, right? They're investigating, they're doing surveillance on disease outbreaks. Um, and so they're trying to track them down, track the, the source, uh, eliminate it, uh, remove the disease. So I mentioned earlier that there was a breakdown specifically in this spot, um, and I guess this uh, trajectory for Genesee County and the state health department. In fact, Genesee County thought that they could just share data with the CDC and get help directly from the CDC. <laughs> Meanwhile, the CDC is like, what the heck are you doing? Talk to your health, <laughs> your state health department. <laughs> so the, the way the um, dynamic works is the CDC, essentially, um, the MDHHS in this case, was essentially Michigan's branch of the CDC. So it's, it's their like the protocols to go through them. And so they kind of got slapped on the wrist for that. So um, if we take a look at data leading up to 2015, and at the time that I have for the data is really just showing the first uh, summer's outbreak. This is Legionella cases, Legionellosis cases, um, by illness onset or referral date for Genesee County. So this is that county's, uh, where Flint is, their historic data. So 2010, they had a case uh, every month for most of the summer months, um, and maybe two cases, up to three cases sometimes, one month they had four cases, but generally you see they're just kind of a, a few cases over the summer um, every year. Well, remember that in April 2014, that's when the Flint water crisis, uh, Flint water was switched to the Flint River, and suddenly, boom, uh, lots of cases coming through. And if you looked at the uh, 2015 data, you'd see another spike over the summer. Um, pretty similar to that one. And so I wish I still had access to this type of data and could see like what happened after uh, 2016, because that would be pretty neat. Um, presumably the outbreak has gone away and it's just back to kind of baseline stuff. So if you take a look and you want to say, blame the water, well, you have to ask a few questions. And again, this is a snapshot of data 
in 2015. If you take a look at the water sources at the residence of the people that got sick. Uh, we had 45 people in the sample um, batch here. 21 of them were on City of Flint water. Three of them were on City of Flint township water. Four were on some other municipal water. Um, seven on private wells. 10 didn't know or couldn't find that data. And so we see that you know, in total, a little over half the people were on City of Flint, but there were also certainly, you know, 15, 16% of the people were on private wells. So we're not getting sick from the water directly um, as far as we can tell. And so the, another question that was asked is, okay, well, what about healthcare exposure? Um, and so if you take a look at those numbers, it turns out that um, of the people that were on well, really, I'll just look, lump these together. So generally, about half the people that were um, that were sick also had healthcare exposure. That there is, it, it looks like, you know, there's still about half the people had no known healthcare exposure, and a lot of those that had some other water at their residence, uh, which I guess could be the city of Flint Township other municipal or private well or unknown, half of those also had no known healthcare exposure. So perhaps this was an out, there was some other source as well. Um, but if we take a look at the hospital exposure data, um, at the time, again, a little more drama here for you. Um, my wife knew which one hospital A was. That was McLaren Hospital. And at the time, Blair, I think that's how you spell it. Um, at the time, the higher ups in LDH, or excuse me, uh, Mich Michigan's health department were buddies with McLaren's higher ups. So the word came down that this was not to be announced. This was to be hushed. The names should never be said. Um, really just kind of silenced the um, the people my wife was work, working with and my wife herself from speaking up to say, hey, this hospital is associated with this outbreak. Which is entirely a corrupt and um, I think that's where the the uh, manslaughter cases have some credibility is for for that to happen. And I can only hope that the, the people that were actually responsible for those decisions are um, taking the blame. But this whole hospital A thing um, now, it's not all the way Hospital A, so it seems like there was just more Legionella in the system in general. The CDC did confirm um, that Flint River water was associated with these bacteria, uh, but certainly a problem. And uh, later it came out and McLaren has been blamed. Essentially, most hospitals operate their own water systems in-house. They'll take the city water and then they like to have a little better control over it than just whatever the city has in an effort to keep their patients safer. And they have a lot of wastewater um, considerations to deal with as well. So um, turns out that they were probably not cleaning their internal water distribution system, management system properly. Um, maybe had some operation or maintenance issues and probably had a, a system that had um, essentially that was colonized with Legionella. And so that was creating conditions for their patients to be uh, sickened with Legionnaires' disease. Okay. Got any questions for me? Interesting, I hope. <laughs> Last semester when uh, when it was all, was this the last semester? Were we all virtual last semester? Was that last semester? Half and half. Okay, it was either last semester or, the, or last year. I had my, my wife join me on the live stream to, to talk about this, this last section. So I do have a, that recorded at, 
at some point if you wanted to hear her perspective. Um, she, she was thinking about joining today, um, but then uh, she was wanting to sleep in and I had, hadn't reminded her or anything, so I wasn't gonna <laughs> drag her out of bed to come in and <laughs> lecture with me. Okay, well, hope you enjoyed that. We'll probably have a quiz on it, so take a look at those readings um, associated with it. Uh, you know, let your interest drive you, um, but give yourself a chance to be interested by going and opening it up and taking a look. Um, browse through those. Okay, so then we'll have an exam review and homework to do on Tuesday next week, and then an exam a week from today. All right, so have a good weekend. email that I might try and send you like a rough draft of what I'm working on by like a week or two. Okay. You know, I think I did see your email and I like put it out of my mind because I thought I was wrong because I saw it. That's and fine. Thought about it. It looks looks like a good topic. Okay. Cool. So good. Okay. Thank you. I'm Thank so sorry. You. No, no worries. <laughs> I just want to make sure like if I send you a rough draft you're not like, no, no 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 that's great. Thank you.